The race to the moon is undoubtedly the most iconic time in spaceflight history, and at its climax you had a battle between what used to be the two largest rockets ever built. Two massive superpowers, constantly at the brink of potentially world-ending war, were channeling massive amounts of money into outdoing each other by advancing the technology of the time. The US and the Soviet Union obviously had deep cultural differences, which led to different design philosophies, but eventually they settled on fairly similar mission architecture. A single massive rocket would be used to launch a mothership and a lander. The lander would actually descend to the moon and then return to the mothership, and then the mothership was responsible for bringing the crew back to Earth. To fulfill this purpose, the US designed the Saturn V and the Soviets designed the N1. Overall, they're pretty similar in terms of size, thrust, payload capacity, but at their core, literally their core first stage, there's a stark difference. The Saturn V's first stage was powered by five F1 engines. These are the largest, most powerful single chamber engines ever developed to this day. Each engine could create 1.5 million pounds of thrust for a total first stage thrust of 7.5 million pounds. The N1, on the other hand, used 30 NK-15 engines, which created greater total thrust, but each individual engine was only creating 340,000 pounds of thrust, which is less than a quarter of an F1. Ultimately, the Saturn V would fly many times with a perfect record, and the N1 blew up four times without ever getting past the first stage. A lot of people want to oversimplify this situation, and they pin a lot of the blame on the sheer complexity of trying to run so many engines at once. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It was not always plain sailing for the US either. Creating and harnessing all of that thrust in the F1 engine is infamously one of the biggest technical achievements of Apollo. Work on the F1 engine began very early, all the way back in 1955, before the Soviets had even launched the very first satellite, Sputnik and engine testing took over a decade. Originally, the Air Force had actually contracted Rocketdyne to build the big F-1 engine, but they paused the program because they didn't really have a rocket that needed it. Luckily, a brand new agency named NASA decided to take on the project and keep developing the engine because they suspected it could be useful in the future. During testing, they found out that there was a massive issue with building massive engines combustion instability. Standard rocket engines work by injecting fuel and oxidizer into a combustion chamber, where they combust, expand, and release energy in the form of thrust. At the time, the state-of-the-art injector technology was a very simple design known as a showerhead injector. This consists of a flat plate with a bunch of holes in it. These holes are paired up so that a high-pressure stream of fuel intersects with a high pressure stream of oxidizer, which causes them to mix and atomize for a smooth, efficient burn. But as the diameter of these combustion chambers increased, the flow became more complex. Slight differences in the amount of oxygen or fuel could cause a hot spot, which would result in higher pressure on one side of the injector face. That high pressure pocket would then slow the flow coming out of that part of the injector, and consequently, more flow would come out of the rest of the injector. Now, because that high pressure pocket was getting less propellant, the pressure would go back down, but a new high pressure pocket would appear on the opposite side of the injector. This pressure wave would bounce back and forth across the engine, growing in magnitude until something broke. In the past, smaller engines had been able to overcome this issue by refining their pumps and their plumbing to make sure you're getting consistent fuel flow everywhere in the engine. But the F1 was proving to be too big and too complex. So the team shifted their focus from preventing combustion instability to damping it out so that when it did occur, it dissipated quickly and didn't grow in magnitude. To test this consistently, they started planting black powder explosives inside of the combustion chamber. When that went off, it would trigger a massive oscillation and the goal was to slow that down before it had enough time to rip the engine apart. And to do that, they tried just about everything they could think of. Different hole patterns, different number of fuel injectors, peroxidizer injectors, or oxidizer per fuel, they added baffles on the injector face, and then they beefed those up and made massive copper wedges which were actively cooled to prevent them from melting. This leads to one of my favorite stories from Apollo, The Race to the Moon by Charles Murray and Catherine Cox. Jim Mizell went out to Canoga Park to help measure what was going on inside. He watched as the combustion instability team kept trying to find a fix that worked. It got so bad that the engineers couldn't come up with a theory for the plate that they hadn't tried before. He recalled that they turned the plate over to a bunch of craftsmen in the back of the plant. Mizell was out there one night and saw them boring holes like crazy. 
Mizell finally said to them, what are you guys doing? They replied, well, we've got this plate and we're supposed to bore holes in it until we're tired. And then you guys are going to take it out to the test stand and fire it for us. They had codenamed this particular injector plate, the kitchen sink. And they never did find a magic bullet. They just iterated over and over, gradually eroding the combustion instability, but it was never gone for sure. Eventually, somebody said, good enough, let's fly the thing. And they flew it, and it had a perfect record. But with the success of Apollo and the failure of the N1 in the history books, the industry was able to move on, having learned a lesson that you can reduce complexity by flying with a smaller number of highly refined battle-tested engines, at least for a while. Fast forward to 2005, and a little company known as SpaceX had an announcement. Before they even had their first launch, SpaceX was already claiming that they were going to build a large, fully reusable rocket with nine engines. That large number of engines was justified by saying that it provided more redundancy and engine out capability, meaning that if one engine failed, it could still complete its mission. It would also help with reusability on the first stage because they were planning to land it and you can shut off eight of your nine engines and you instantly get one ninth the thrust, giving you more fine throttle control. But you know, 20 years ago, nobody was taking that claim seriously. And the final reason they gave was that it would let them reuse the Merlin engine, which they were developing for the Falcon 1. The Falcon 1 launched with a single Merlin and it failed and failed and failed again until in 2008, it finally had its first successful flight. Ultimately, that rocket flew five times, three of those failed. So jumping all the way to a Falcon 9 at that point seemed a bit ambitious. Of course, now we all know that the Falcon 9 has been incredibly successful, if not fully reusable, but watching it introduce first stage reusability is the closest thing my generation has had to a moonshot, complete with its own politically divisive chief engineer slash hype man. But even all the way back in 2005, Elon Musk was already talking about a different rocket known as BFR, aka Big Falcon Rocket. Even back then, it was already targeting about 100 tons to low Earth orbit, but instead of developing a new Raptor engine, they were originally going to use a whole bunch of Merlins. But as BFR started to enter development in 2017 and was renamed Starship in 2018, it started to attract some more scrutiny. Nine engines was a lot, and Falcon Heavy was going to be pushing it at 27. Now they're talking about a whole new rocket with more than 30 brand new engines? This is crazy, and critics started to draw parallels between Starship and the N1, and this brought back the age-old question of how many engines is too many engines? There are two main camps on this debate, which essentially boil down to reducing the risk of an engine failure and reducing the risk of a launch failure. Camp 1 would claim that the more engines you have, the more likely one is to blow up, and Camp 2 would counter that the more engines you have, the more likely it is that you could have one fail and it not cause your mission to fail. And that is the core question of this video. What is the trade-off in reliability as you add more engines? Well, an exact number is not possible here, especially between different vehicles. I mean, there's a million and one ways a rocket cannot make it to space. Only one of those is random engine explosion. And a lot of the other ones get a lot harder as you add more engines and more moving parts to your rocket. You're adding more wiring, more plumbing, more holes in your propellant tank, more complex avionics and control software. On the other hand, that does give you more redundancy. So let's boil this question down to just failures that are internal to the engines themselves. For the risk of experiencing an engine failure, it's incredibly simple. You just multiply the risk of one engine exploding by your total number of engines. For example, a relatively low reliability of 90% would mean that a single engine rocket would experience an engine failure failure on one out of every 10 launches. And with the same reliability, a 33 engine rocket like Starship would expect to have an average engine failure of 3.3 engines per launch. This plot will show you the number of engine failures you would expect per launch as a function of engine reliability and the number of engines, starting with a basic rocket with one engine, a five engine rocket to represent the Saturn V, 
a 9-engine rocket to represent the Falcon 9, and a 33-engine rocket standing in for Starship. To the surprise of no one, this very boring chart shows that more engines means you're more likely to experience a failure. Now, with modern computers, we can track the health of engines much more reliably, and if something's going wrong, we're able to shut them down earlier instead of letting them run into a catastrophic failure. That, combined with some shielding and adequate fire suppression, means it's totally possible that you could have an engine failure that doesn't kill all of the neighboring engines. So, assuming that's true, how do we find out the likelihood of experiencing too many engine failures? Well, to figure that out, we need to know the engine out capability of these rockets. The single engine is easy, you can't lose it, you have zero engine out capability. The Saturn V allegedly had one engine out capability, but this might have only been for part of the flight. If it happened too early, it could doom you, or if it was a particular engine, it could be bad. We're just gonna say one. Same for the Falcon 9, just going to say one. Starship, we're going to say three. I think that's the uh, capability from launch, but later in the mission, you could probably get away with more. That was a lot of talking for basically saying it's zero, one, one, and three. I started out trying to solve this analytically, but once I got past the trivial case of one engine, it got a bit more difficult. I got far enough to see that it wasn't going to be an elegant solution. There's not just going to be an equation where you plug in your number of engines, likelihood of failure, your engine out capability, and poof, you have your likelihood of a launch failure. It's gonna be different for every case. But then, I remembered I don't have to. It's 2024, we have technology, I can just run several million simulations in MATLAB and get an approximate answer. So here is a new plot where the y-axis is the likelihood of a successful launch and the x-axis is engine reliability. A single engine rocket is trivial because the launch reliability is equal to the engine reliability. A five engine rocket like Saturn V with single engine out capability is clearly more reliable even at very low engine reliability numbers. If we add a 9 engine rocket like the Falcon 9, it's obviously going to be much worse than the 5 engine rocket because we're assuming they have the same engine out capability, but you can see that as long as you have engine reliability above 96.7%, it's actually going to be better than the single engine case. And given the fact that the Merlin engine on the Falcon 9 has reliability somewhere in the high 99%, uh, it's going to way outperform the single engine rocket. And now we finally get to the big question, which is what happens when we add Starship to the plot? It actually starts off better than the Falcon 9, and as long as it has more than 96% engine reliability, it will beat a Falcon 1. And once it has an engine reliability that's higher than 98%, it even beats the Saturn V. We don't know the exact reliability of the Raptor engines on Starship, but we can make an educated guess based on the first three launches. Flight 1 had three failures, at least until a fire started, spread, and killed the rest of the engines, but that's sort of a separate issue and could happen to any rocket, even though it's kind of harder to deal with because there's more engines. But let's just call that three failures, and then the next two launches would have perfect reliability, at least until stage separation. After stage separation, we have seen additional engine failures, but that does seem to be more based on fuel slosh and re-entry damage, which, I mean, one, no other company is dealing with because they're not reusing their boosters, and two, is not really caused by the number of engines. So let's call that three failures out of 99 engines launched. That's conservatively 97%. Obviously, since that first launch, there's been a lot of improvements to the Raptor engine, and they've done ground tests, and they've done suborbital hops. So the real reliability is going to be well above 97. I would say the Raptor is probably already well past 99% reliability. Based on this plot, you're well into the range where it's outperforming the Falcon 9 and the Saturn V thanks to that three-engine out capability. And what that tells me is that uh, some of my fellow armchair engineers who have been wary of the 33 engines are misplacing their concern. Starship is Obviously, a complex engineering challenge that's still being worked on, but the oversimplified analysis calculation that 33 engines is 33 ways you can fail is not what's going on here. In reality, any reasonably well-tested engine is going to have a reliability that's above that critical 98% where having 33 engines and 3 engine out is a net positive. The issues we're currently seeing with Starship are only tangentially related to the engines, like the fire on the first flight. The second booster that failed only did so after hot staging, which we believed caused pretty massive fuel sloshing, which then produced debris, which blocked fuel filters, and that killed the engines. 
another case where the engines were not the root cause of the failure. And while we still don't have information on the third flight, that booster only failed after it had re-entered the atmosphere for the very first time. And it was trying to relight its engines during a very aggressive roll oscillation. So it's much more likely that that failure has something to do with the heat shielding on the bottom of the rocket, or the attitude control not performing as expected at different layers of the atmosphere. As the saying goes, space is hard, but for the most part, it looks like more engines has been more better. I'm gone happy. Bye.